Let's pray. Father, we do give you thanks for gathering us here this morning. A chance to gather in this place within this body in a, in a place and in a moment that is intended to be by you, given to us as a gift and intended to be a foretaste of glory to come. It sometimes seems far from what it is representing, the assembly of the saints in the presence of God forever. We are gathered here now, few in number, in a room, in a city, in a state, in a country, and we are gathered with your people in heaven and in other lands. We are assembled before you. A little outpost here in Salt Lake, and you gathered us this morning, and we say thank you. Visit us with some touch, some drop of that glory even now, please. We can't hope to experience that as simple human beings speaking English about a, words in a book. But we can hope to experience that as people, citizens of your kingdom, because you have given us a down payment, the Spirit who lives within us. He lives within us each as little temples and among the body here as a temple. He dwells with us, and we say thank you for him and pray then, Lord, that you would, by his ministry, give us a taste of heaven. And as we just sung, that you would shine light into darkness and give new life. We can pray this, Lord, and, and in a way, if we were to open our eyes and look around, we'd see blue chairs in a gym and we'd say, what? But we can pray this in faith, seeing the city that is to come. Thank you. Thank you for being God, for being faithful, for being a Savior, for being so deeply committed to abiding with us, your people now, and to make us new. Thank you. We consider a text this morning, Lord, that tells us in, in some ways some things that are uh, disappointing about the world and perhaps intimidating about the world, frustrating. But in this text also there is something of great hope and, and promise. So help us to hold them both and, and to, to rest in promise and to rest in the truth that you are with us, making us new and giving life, giving new and real life even now to your people. We saw last week that you said, People of the kingdom are greater, no matter who they are, greater than John the Baptist even. Not because he's not saved and won't be in heaven, but because we now experience kingdom life different than he did. We know something more than he knows, than he knew. So help us to live in that and to experience it even now and to walk out this life in that newness. Thank you. Open your word, teach us, build us, grow us. You are a good God, and we express before you our, our humble dependence, our hope, and our thanksgiving. We pray in Christ's name, our Savior sent by you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. our attention in the middle of Luke chapter 7 where we find Jesus still speaking to the crowd regarding John the Baptist. John had sent messengers to Jesus with an important question, one that as we considered it, one that we, we share also. From time to time as we look at difficult circumstances, we like him wonder, are you in fact the promised one who was to come? Because John 
knew, had heard of some good things, but also knew that, that what he was hearing about, what he was experiencing in, in prison himself is not the elimination of evil, the elimination of all wickedness like he expected would happen when God's Messiah came. So he wondered, are you the one? And Jesus answered by, as was just referenced before by Charlie, pointing around and saying, look and see, see. I don't know you see it, but see. This is the beginning of the kingdom. These are the works. This is the evidence. The kingdom has come. Like a day that dawns, it's not fully here, but it has indeed begun. I'm the one. Blessed is the one who's not put off by me, coming in meekness and in mercy now. I come in later in judgment, but I'm in meekness and in mercy now. There's great blessing in embracing me. That's his answer. And then the messengers leave, and Jesus continues speaking to the crowds that we considered last week, and he clarifies for everybody that John was indeed the preparing prophet sent by God before the one who was to come, before the Messiah, to prepare people for Christ. If Jesus is going to come as meek and merciful, that's going to be completely misunderstood, taken for granted, really, until before that there is one, like John the Baptist, who comes pointing out sin, preaching God's law, calling people to obedience. And in that calling to obedience and the call for repentance, people, when God gives sight, see themselves as in need of help from God, poor in spirit, and then right to that comes meek and merciful Messiah. John comes to prepare people so that the meek and merciful one makes sense and fits. That was John. John's ministry of preparation. And as we consider, as we listen to that and consider repentance, we also, today even, are put in a position where we can receive, and then having received, can live out this life that is greater than the life that John the Baptist knew. Particularly because we are in the kingdom, particularly, we know, we know many things, we see many more things about God, but the great thing in particular that is to our advantage is that John never knew Pentecost. He lived in the front side of Pentecost. He, he opened the door for Messiah and could look in, but he never knew it. And every Christian, no matter who you are, least of all in the kingdom, you live this side of Pentecost indwelt by God the Spirit, poured out in a new and in wonderful way for us now, a life far greater than John's life. So the call for us then, be filled with the Spirit and walk through life with Him, enjoying unhindered fellowship. We talked a little bit about fellowship with God that's possible, that is really, which is amazing, that it is really possible for a human being to have fellowship with God. Great privilege. Moment by moment, fellowship with the one true God. That was last week, and it brings us to Jesus' concluding comments this morning here, which are a mix of, of disappointment and direction setting. Because he finished last week by talking about the Pharisees. This is the, the parenthetical comment. The Pharisees who reject the purpose of God for themselves... And as we move into Jesus' comments today, he said, actually, that's what most people are like. Disappointing. There's disappointment as we consider the world that's here, most people, the world that we encounter. But there's also some direction setting because while there is an, an alert there, while there is a warning there, there's also something that points us and shows us who are, in fact, God's people, what our role is in testifying about God's ways in regard to Jesus. So taken together, those two points, if I, if I push them together and summarize this morning's passage, here's the main point that I'm working towards today. God commends his way to the world. God commends his way to the world by way of the lives of his children. God commends his way to the world by way of the lives of his children, of his people. So we're going to work towards this morning. Verses 31 to 35, let me read them, and then I'll make two observations from them. Jesus speaking. 
To what then shall I compare the people of this generation? And what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say, he has a demon. And the Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by all her children. I'm going to unpack this and make two observations we note that Jesus begins with a comparison. The people of this generation, what are they like? Well, he's making a, when he says that, he's making a big, broad statement. The people of this generation, people in general. It's a big brush painting, obviously. Many, even most people, people these days. But then when he gets to verses 34 and 33 and 34, you notice that he says, you say, you say. So he is talking to people who are listening to him. So we need to be careful that we don't think, oh, he's talking about them ones out there only. He's talking to just people, including anybody who hears this. But it's big brush, so it might not be particularly you or particularly you at this time. But it calls for us to, to give consideration to it while realizing that when he talks about they're going to accuse him of being friends of tax collectors and sinners, obviously tax collectors and sinners wouldn't accuse him of being friends of tax collectors and sinners. So there are some people who are excluded from this. Balance this out. Consider, is it you? But recognize that it might not be you. It's just people of this generation in general, what are they like? Uncooperative, demanding children who really just want their own way. We really just want to be in charge. Verse 32, a, a little ditty, might have been a common saying, a part of a children's game perhaps. Nobody's really quite sure, but the point's clear. It's about non-participation and pouting almost. Stubbornness. We played the flute, didn't like that, didn't want to play that game, so we changed it all around and did the opposite. Played a dirge and you didn't like that game, didn't want to play that one either. You're like the baby who whines and cries and wants up, 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 up. Mom picks her up. Three seconds later, goes stiff-bodied and wants down, 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 down. Put her down. Up, 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 up. Down, down, down. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth till exasperated mom just says, Pfft. childish, whining. That's the world. Irrationally restless resistant, uncooperative, fundamentally just wants its way. Which brings us to the first observation. The world is childish in its foolish resistance to God. The world is childish in its foolish resistance to God. Jesus is describing this generation, people in general, in a way that is clearly not a compliment. And, I mean, we all know this. He's obviously talking to adults and says this. That's, it's very, very difficult to win friends and influence people by calling an adult a baby. But that's what Jesus is doing. Childish, immature. How and how it responds to God. In 33 and 34, we get both John the Baptist and the Son of Man described in a particular way that ties them, that's supposed to make us think about God and God's ways, God's work, reminding us that that's the issue. It doesn't just say that John the Baptist didn't eat bread or drink wine. That would have been a, a reasonable way to describe his ascetic lifestyle. John didn't eat bread and drink wine. It doesn't say that. It actually says, John has come eating no bread. And the has come, that's the main verb in the sentence, and it's actually the first word in the sentence. So the emphasis is really loaded on the has come part. Has come John 
eating no bread, drinking no wine. And the same thing for the Son of Man. Has come the Son of Man, eating and drinking. The point is, has come. Which reminds us, oh yeah, that's what he was just talking about. Are you the one who is to come? Has come. And are you the one who was to come before the one who was to come? Has come. This is about God's initiative, God's sending of these messengers, these witnesses of John and Jesus, his initiating, his working in the world, and that work of God, it has come to people. That's, that's the emphasis. And people respond to it resistant. That's what he's getting at, confronting, really kind of popping the bubble here of what all human resistance looks like on the outside, with all of its posturing and all of its reasoned argument that the world offers up. It must be acknowledged, of course, that, that sometimes initially people resist God because they are unaware, they don't know all the, all the facts, but Jesus is moving beyond that and says once all the facts are cleared up, once everything's laid in front of them, what do we have then? The world over, we have more resistance. More childish, irrational, rationalizing resistance. It appears rational. It has reasons and arguments. They have reasons they don't like John. Oh, you know, look at John. He's a nut job. He doesn't eat normal food. He walks around like a crazy guy out in the wilderness. And he's always just thundering about sin and repentance and judgment. He's hard on everybody. And he's not, surely that can't be of God. That's not kind. That's not loving. And he's probably got a demon. Stay away from him. That, that's an argument that's laid out. There are reasons. He's like this, he's like this, he's like this. We should stay away from him. He's got a demon. That's the rationale. Never mind the irrationality of saying that a demon would preach against sin and call people to obey God's law and wait for God's Messiah. That's irrational. But the world offers that as its reason. Same with Jesus. Flip it around. You don't like a nut job? How about a normal guy then who eats and drinks and has good times at weddings like everybody else? Don't want any of that either. Don't like a guy who hammers against sin? How about who is indiscriminately compassionate and helps the hurting people? Don't want any of that either. A real religious guy would be austere and would be separate from sin and would be holy and would, would condemn it. Like John the Baptist? Yes. No. The irrationality of this. That's what Jesus is pointing out here. You got it this way, you got it this way, you don't want either because really, really you just don't want it. That's the point. That's where the world is. Behind every offered argument, behind every reasoned out objection, really at the bottom of it is just a human heart that says, I don't want that. Because that challenges me and my autonomy and my ability to declare this is the way I will go and I will call the shots for me. It's what the world is like. It has no taste for the God of the Bible and it has no desire for submission to Him and no desire for, for broken in spirit and humility beneath a God who is holy. Nothing. That's how Jesus explains the rejection of Him. At which point we've... I say that... And then we got to say, okay, what do we do with that? Because right, right here we're at an awkward point in the text. If, if you notice, it moves to verse 35, which kind of seems to go like this. 35 takes us in a different direction. So we got to kind of like mentally get around, get our minds around what I was just saying. And 
that helps us figure out what of what's 35 about what do we do with with this first part this assessment was well, certainly there there is clearly warning in this because he's talking to people as i said this might not be you exactly because it's, it's big brush but it might be you or it might be you at different times and it might be you if you're not a christian This is how people in general, because this is the human heart that Jesus is exposing. It's not an information problem. It's a heart problem. The information then sits in the the hands of the human, malleable. I'll, I'll change it all to fit what I want it to be. Because my heart says, I don't want. So there's there's clearly warning here in this, maybe for you. Do you find yourself hard word, childishly rationalizing. This is the way of the world. There is in the world just flat out bias. There's no careful examination of the facts. So consider this. Is this you? No careful noticing really no desire to carefully notice the uniqueness of Christian faith, the trustworthiness of the Bible. People say, oh, the Bible's been changed. Actually, it hasn't been. I bet you've never checked it out. You just say it. People say, oh, the Bible's not true. Based on what? Of all the documents in history, the Bible has remarkable agreement and consistency within itself and outside of itself. History and archaeology, the world over, agrees with this text. Have you ever given careful consideration? What's going on at the cross and why was the tomb empty? It was empty. So says the evidence. People throw all that stuff away. Because really, what's really going on there is my heart just does not want that because I get I would have to play someone else's games by his rules, and I don't like that. I want my own. Is that you? Give consideration to that. There's clearly that element, that piece of this, He's talking about how the world, unfortunately, just sets him aside. But there's also a word to Christians about how the world interacts with Jesus that kind of helps shape our minds and sets us up for where verse 35 goes for us. Because what that says is that there... There isn't any hope for us finding just the right argument. Just the the right presentation of just the right facts. And then people will say, oh, I get it. They already got it. The dead live, the lame walk, the blind see. I don't want that. We can't be wise enough or smart enough, and we certainly can't be cool enough or hip enough or attractive enough or relevant enough. We can't plan worship services that have just the right touch of this and the right song here and the right practical message so that people will say, oh, now I want to follow Jesus. That's not going to happen. We're dealing with, Christian, when we, when we interact with the world out there, we're dealing with a world that is fundamentally resistant because it doesn't want him. Well, what do we do about that? Well, there is something for us to do here. And it's, it's, it's interesting because we do it in a kind of an indirect way. We get at this, we we interact with the world in kind of an indirect way. 
We don't play the, the game of let's argue about the facts, and the facts are important. Certainly, we, we, are, we are fundamentally, first and foremost, the Christian faith is about the truth. So everything that I'm going to say is not, please do not misunderstand, it is not a replacement for the truth. This is true. But we can't argue like this. We argue kind of like this, which gets us to the second point. After all the rationalization blows away, we have something that the world doesn't have and can't get and desperately wants. We have a life. We have a life that is greater than any life known to the world. The life of the kingdom. So it brings us to the second point. God's way of wisdom is shown to be right and good by the lives that it produces. God's way of wisdom is shown to be right and good by the lives that it produces. This is what verse 35 puts in front of us, his concluding statement. People in general are like this, rationalizing, resistant, pushing it off, Yet, nonetheless, wisdom is justified by all her children. Wisdom is justified. That is, it is, it is proven and established as correct, and right, good, justified, shown to be in the right. God's way of wisdom is shown right by all of her children. We can tell that he means God's wisdom here because if it just meant generic wisdom, that it's a nonsense statement. Everybody already argues, everybody already believes that wisdom is good and folly is bad. That's not saying anything. What needs to be established or justified is a particular wisdom, that this is wisdom and this is good. What Jesus means is the wisdom that I, Jesus, would call wise, God's wisdom. God's way. It's proven right, it's justified, shown to be good and right by the lives of the children it produces. First part of the passage has children who are acting childishly, and the second part, verse 35, has a different kind of child. Children born of God who will be different and whose lives will then show the goodness of the wisdom of God. This is the indirect. Remember what I already said. This is not a replacement for truth. We, we, we would not argue, we, we must not argue that because this, is, this life is thus and so, therefore it must be true. It's not a replacement for truth. It's a support. It's an evidence of truth. It's a proof for truth. The truth stands, the truth is truth, but it's shown, it's justified by the lives of these children, these children of God. When you see all of the children, justified by all her children, any particular child, any particular Christian, of course we all, we, we all know that any particular Christian in any particular time might be frankly sinful, frankly foolish. All of the children in the big picture must be considered. And when you do that, when you look at the people of God, what you find is something incredibly different. Different. You see that each person and this person people as a whole, this people of the kingdom of God, are different, are being made different, and are in fact different as a whole than anything else out there. This should, this should get into our minds in, it, in a way that is, I think, 
attractive because what, what's being talked about here is how do we engage with a world that frankly is just resistant, 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 and rationalizing? Well, we engage with it indirectly in a way that is kind of whole and real, and it should be attractive to you because it's, what it's talking about is you and your life and a life of privilege. This, this people, these children, are ones who have listened to John the Baptist's call for repentance and have then received this merciful Messiah and have been changed, been made new creations. We're talking about you, Christian. You had to give up your life. You had to lay it all down, certainly. But what you found then was true humanity. When you were saved, you were made reborn as a baby, yeah, as as an infant. But you were made back into a real person. A baby. You you got to grow. There's maturing, absolutely, in the process. But a new creation, different, born again. Without troubles, without any heartache, without any complexity? Of course not. But when you were born again as a new child of God, Something happened to you that you were, you were made with a new mind that, you know this, you've got to stop and think about this, you get the world. Before, you didn't get it. You didn't know where you came from, why this was, and where it was going. You didn't know that. There are a thousand theories out there. And you actually now understand perfectly. No, but you get it. You are alive and you have wisdom and understanding in a new and in a profound way. You get life because you actually understand God. Perfectly? No. Truly, though, yes. And because of that, because you were made a new person and given a new understanding of the world, because you have a new understanding, a new fellowship with God, you are intended to outlive the world. I don't mean live longer than, and I certainly don't mean try harder to live cleaner and more properly than. But like a fruit tree, you were made to bear fruit. And the world is not a fruit tree and cannot bear fruit. That is night and day different. Fruit tree bearing fruit, non-fruit tree cannot bear fruit. Now, recall what I said last week about greatness and greatness in the world. When I'm talking about bearing fruit, I'm not meaning can't be incredibly intelligent, can't be nice, can't be beautiful, can't be good. I don't mean that. I mean fruit. I mean spiritual, homeless shalom. I mean the kind of life that is covered with, that is, that is classified as, that it would be described as a life that is at rest, that is a life of peace, a life of hope, a life of joy, a life of contentment, a life of self-control. Regardless, as was prayed earlier, regardless of circumstances around, here is a man, a woman, a teenager at peace because he knows God and understands the world and actually walks through it with him. That is you and cannot be them. But every human heart was made for that. We long for it. And so the direct attack of here's the facts, here's the truth. So no, 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 I resist, I, I dodge, I smoke screen, but I'm, I'm the side. But what I'm dodging and living a smoke screen trying to get, you actually have. Huh. Huh. 
We are intended to. We are made again so as to outlive the world. Children begotten by God in the gospel, we are real human beings again. This is what proves the rightness and the goodness of God's way and God's work in Christ. Which maybe should call for repentance in us as we think about it, because so often we live beneath it. So consider that. As I said last week, don't focus on it, but consider Do you live as a pauper when you're actually a rich citizen? Do you live as an orphan when you're actually an adopted child and heir? Consider that and repent if necessary. We start there, we kind of keep our eye on that, always aware of the barrier that breaks fellowship with God. We talked about this last week. But then... Somebody may ask then, so what what do I do? Do this. Take your Bible. Flip back the previous page. This works for my Bible. This this, (laughs) This is not really the reason that you shouldn't have an iPad Bible, but or an iPhone Bible, but works for my Bible. Flip it back one page and do that. And what you just did was you grabbed hold of the Sermon on the Mount. At least in my Bible. Maybe repentance is called for, but what you do then as you walk through life is you flip the page back and you put your hand out and you grab a hold of the Sermon on the Mount. This is important to think about because oftentimes somebody, you may be thinking or somebody may ask, this is... Okay, theologically, I see this, I get this, I'm a new creation, I'm to bear fruit. Okay, but what do I do, like, tomorrow? What you do is you flip the page back, you grab the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' sermon. It, it is not like one among many, it's the sermon. It's seminal, it's foundational. What do I do as a Christian What does he call me to? Faith worked out through love is what counts. And to say that we outlive the world is to put it like this. We can outlove the world because we can give away our lives knowing our reward is great in heaven. Sermon on the Mount. We can outbless the world because we know I am a deeply blessed one. We outforgive the world having been forgiven. We outgive the world being recipients of everything we possibly need. We outmercy the world being objects of mercy from our Father. We turn the other cheek and we give away our cloak and we lend expecting nothing in return, all the while rejoicing and leaping for joy because great is your reward in heaven. This is the Sermon on the Mount. That's what you do. You outlove and you outbless and you outforgive and you undercondemn and you you outlive the world. Do that. How? Not in your own power. Where does Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount constantly drive that back to? I said it a couple times there. He constantly drives that back to, roots it constantly in the glorious truth of the gospel for you. The whole Sermon on the Mount sets up, you have received mercy, so give mercy. Great is your reward in heaven, you child of God, you son of God, you daughter of God. So give away everything. Blessed are you who mourn, weep, because great is your reward. He's constantly showing us, do this because of this. Christ has died for you, caused you to be born again as a new child, has made you something, someone different, a real human being, incredibly secured in his hand and remarkably blessed by his mercy and grace, kept forever. Give your life away. 
like the world cannot. Because the world knows if I give my life away, I cannot get it back. Because it can't. This is a life unknown in the world. And all of it, in you, another way of putting this, all of it is the fruit of the Spirit in you. So what do you do in the face of the foolish world? You repent, if, when needed, and you ask, God, by your Spirit who lives in me, will you this morning this day, this moment, remind me and press upon me these great truths that I am yours because of Christ. I am forgiven. I am an object of mercy and I will forever live in your hand. Remind me that my protection is sure and my reward is great and that you are in every moment of this day and in everything that happens to me, even if I can't see you and can't see how that can be, because you have never left me and will not forsake me. That's the Spirit's ministry in the life of a Christian. The Holy Spirit, God in us, is, is kind of like an, the, the earbud that is constantly talking to you and saying, you are a believer. I am with you. I will not leave you. You can walk with me. You can trust me. I am good. Remind me of these things, Father. Father. Use this truth to control my heart and direct me to live out faith in love like this. And the life that comes from that, the life that comes out of you, is that life which is greater than the life John the Baptist knew and the life that's greater than anybody on the earth can know. evidence that this Jesus is in fact true and right and good because of the fruit that he bears in your life. This is our task. And in fact, it's at the heart of evangelism. Genuine, whole evangelism. The Bible doesn't know anything about training and programs and techniques and tools. Which isn't to say they're bad, because the Bible doesn't know anything about them. It doesn't condemn them either. But it quite obviously does not rest upon them. Because it doesn't know anything about them. There's nothing there. I've used tools, we've got tools, giveaway tools, training's great, but realize there's none of that here. What there is here is what I was just talking about, lived right next to non-Christian people that you love and love even when they're your enemies. And then, when they ask you, you're ready to give them an answer for the hope that lives in you. Maybe you use a tool. This is, this is how the Bible appreciates, how the Bible perceives of the spread of the truth. It is lived. It is truth. It, there is content. It is, it is factual. But it is undergirded and, and really commended by a life that is completely different than the life known by the world. And one great problem that we have today, this is, this is the great need of the world to see this actually lived out, the great need of the church, because one of our great problems today is that we have a ton of tools and no life. Says the miserable Christian who's, who's captured by sin, come trust Jesus and know eternal life. Why? You're miserable and just like me. There's got to be a life there. A life that, that when we sin, deals with it differently. Because we will sin. And actually, that's part of the life. 
When we sin, we know we are not condemned but are forgiven and strive to grow in holiness, beloved children. That's a really different way of dealing with sin than the world deals with sin. I'm not saying we need to live sinlessly. I'm I'm saying we need to live as Christians and and as whole Christians, as fruit-bearing Christians, as spirit-filled Christians, ready to give an answer for the reason of the hope that we have but commending it with our lives constantly. This is a great need in in evangelism, a great need of the church, and frankly, it's what you want. You want to live the life of shalom. You want that. That is good. It's the life that God meant to deliver to you when he died and birthed you again. A life that is like and increasingly becoming more like Christ, like a true human. This is so, I I don't know if it is to you. For me, as I think about this, this is so compelling. Because what it says is, I pursue God. I walk with the Spirit. I fill my mind with the Scriptures, and I become the person. I I live the life that I really want. And you know what? That's what enables me to encounter the world. That's what enables me to, to deal with the first several verses of this passage Argue and rationalizing and shift and smoke screen. Okay, great. Let me love you. And let me live out this Christian life that I want anyway. God commends. God commends his way as right and good. God commends to the world the beauty and the truth of Jesus in large part by using the lives of his people as exhibit A. Look what I make. Look what happens when somebody gives up their life to me. What comes out of the other side is glorious. Come, taste and see. The wisdom of God is justified by all her children. May God, may may God capture your mind that you would say, "That, that is what I want. And would he then move you day by day to say every morning, every moment, Spirit of God, Have control of me. Fill my mind with the truth and move me. Give me eyes to see the truth. Give me faith to believe it and move me to out of faith follow. Walk with the Spirit. Walk with the Spirit. Live the life that God meant for you to live and be the witness he means for you to be. Let me pray. Father, I am thankful that you gave to your people a life far better than even the great prophets of the Old Testament knew. You gave to us the life this side of the cross, this side of Pentecost. You gave to us the life of the Spirit, fruitful. fruitful even in profound ways as we are made new. I'm thankful for that. And I also, with my brothers and sisters here, acknowledge that we fall down and we are still children in need of your fatherly, kind guidance, of your discipline, of your correction, of your encouragement. So please give that to us each. Grow us up. 
Cause us each to see your smile. We come from a hundred different places here, Lord. And, and cause us each, to wherever we are, to see your smile, to be drawn on by your pleasure. That's your work, Spirit of God. So please do that in us. Own us, build us, and use us as witnesses in the world to call in your people, to commend Christ. Use us towards that end, we pray. Amen.